What if you were a young man filled with all kinds of hope, great athletic ability, and the future is unlimited, then suddenly an accident and everything is turned around? <laughs> Hi, my name is Father Mike Manning. God bless you. Thank you very much for tuning into the program. You are going to be blessed. This is a very special program, touching you in your experience of Jesus and touching you with an understanding that your faith is real and it's not just some church thing that's far off from reality. We're going to be talking with a very fine young man, a man who experienced a high dream of hope and experience with athletic prowess, and then suddenly things turned around but he turned around in a way that allowed him to come closer to God and enabled you and me to have our strength, our faith strengthened. God bless you. Thank you very much for coming and being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to have you here. Tell us a little bit about your story, would you, Damien? I, I'm gonna kind of turn it over to you. Um, you, were, you were doing very well in school. You were doing well in, in sports. Um, tell us a little bit about that, and then if you could, get into how everything turned around. Okay, I was, uh, you know, I was blessed from a young age to have a, a very tight Italian Catholic family, and they had uh, put me into Catholic high school, and I ended up going to a Catholic college up at uh, U uh, University of San Diego. Um, I had graduated, and uh, things, were, things were looking up. I just got my degree. I had just gotten a job in uh, Newport Beach. I'd just finished up my football career. Uh, we were on vacation with my family, and I dove off the back of a pontoon boat, and the way in which my chin hit the water uh, I dislocated my fourth and fifth cer cervical vertebrae, mm. which left me paralyzed immediately. So I jumped off the back of the boat, and the minute my face hit the water, I remember looking down at the bottom of Lake Mead, Nevada, and thinking, I can't move. What's going on? So they, uh, they dragged me to the shore, and uh, you know, an hour or two went by, but um, it was hard to remember what had happened after that. But 10 days later, I wake up in a hospital, and the doctors are shining a light in my eyes saying, do you know why you're here? And uh, I had some cracked teeth, so I was like, yeah, I need to see a dentist. Something, something's majorly wrong. And I said, well, try to scratch your nose. And when I went up to scratch my nose, I had recognized that uh, from chin down, I was, I was paralyzed. From, wow. And uh, when the doctor came in, he basically kind of gave me the diagnosis and explained to me what had happened and you know, said, you have a spinal cord injury, and, and these are the uh, percentages that you'll get better. And, you know, and I looked right at him, and I said, well, doc, if, you know, has anybody in this position ever made a recovery, and, and is it possible? And he said, well, yeah, it's possible. And I said, well, with all due respect, I'm, I'm not really interested in any other information that you might have. Go tell it to my parents, but you know, anything's possible. So you know, knowing that you know, there is uh, the idea that I'll be able to move through this, I mean, it was very scary because um, uh, it was definitely at the bottom looking up. I mean, the prognosis that they gave me was you know, that you're gonna be in the wheelchair for the rest of your life, not able to move or feel anything from chin down. And they gave me a wheelchair and a bottle of pills and they said, this is it, you know, good luck. Oh. Hello. Yeah, wake up call. It was, uh, it was scary. Now, in the midst of all of this, tell me a little bit about your relationship with God and with Christ. You know what? Normally, you would, you would imagine that a situation like this would, would have me upset or angry, but uh, you know, I had, I had a great deal of support, and um, I've always been a very driven person, and um, I have, I've had faith in God, and it, it, it's what had got me to the point where I had been so blessed with my family and my brothers, and been able to attend some uh, good schools and have a good education. So it was a little bit confusing to say, to say the least because when I have all these real world um, diagnoses that say that you know, your physical body isn't this or that, you know, to, to lean on faith at that point, you kind of don't know where to begin. So I would say that uh, you know, I had an extremely blessed existence before this had happened, but uh, once you know, the wheels hit the pavement, I really realized that uh, faith is an all-encompassing thing, and it's, it's an all-in situation. Could you tell me, give me a little bit of an ear into, what was your conversation with God at this time? Um, I had an experience before I had woken up, and uh, it, it, was one of, it was one that kind of words don't really describe, but uh, I had a conversation with whatever it might be, it might, maybe in my head or, or a light or this and that, that I had to 
come back to my life with purpose. And there were three different things that I, that I had to do. And uh, the conversation had gone down that you need to fix the few things about yourself that, have, that are making you incomplete. And then you need to serve your purpose with your friends and your family. And then you need to get back to what it is that you want to do or the, what you should be doing with your purpose on earth. So when I woke up and the doctor had given me the diagnosis of basically your life's over and everything that you've ever known is, is going to change drastically, something in my gut um, told me that it, that it wasn't going to. And so I continued to pray and I continued to ask God to give me strength. And a lot of, in a lot of ways, you know, I didn't understand the strength that was being given to me. I, I knew that there was something greater and I knew mm -hmm. that there was something to push for, but it wasn't until I got home from, you know, pretty much four months stay in the hospital and the doors opened to the elevator when I got off the airport and there was 50 people there wow. and they were all there to support me. So I want to say that a lot of this has been a gift that has been brought to me with and through other people, very much like God says that it's going to be, that they've kind of guided me and carried me through some of the toughest times that I've had in my life and really shown me what faith is. So I've always had it within my, within my being, but at the same time, it was, you know, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if you would, that kind of carried me in a time where I didn't know how to carry myself. I, I think a lot of, nowadays of this, this phrase, the body of Christ, St. Paul talks about that, and he talks about the presence of Christ in the church, in the community. And, and I'm, I'm resonating with that as you say this, that in the midst of the fear and the confusion of what it means to all of a sudden be faced with the world, you were, you were met by the body of Christ, if you will, the church, that came to you and, and cheered and clapped Absolutely. and stood by you and, and, and loved you and, and, and helped to move into some of the things that you're now dreaming and hoping for to come in the future. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And how, about, how about your family? Tell me, tell me a little bit about your mom and dad and their reaction to this. And Do you have brothers and sisters? I do. Have, uh, I have three younger brothers. Okay. Four technically, but uh, you know, three, three men and boys. But uh, there's, there's five of us total. And uh, I had another brother that kind of helped me through this situation, a, a friend of a family that kind of became our family. But I was always the leader being the oldest of four boys. And you know, with, uh, with a football career that was somewhat decorated, I was... I was just that guy that was always in the light and this and that. So when I ended up getting hurt, you know, being the first kid that had gone to graduate high school and then graduated college, I don't want to say my family wasn't there. They were. I had to learn how to accept them for who they were. They gave me their very best effort. But at the same time, when, you know, somebody that is always, you know, bigger than life, if you would, in relationship to the world, gets knocked down in relationship to the world, um, you would expect us to band but together. Things that can be turned around. It, it just, it just, their help was difficult to understand at first because as much as it was difficult being paralyzed in a wheelchair, they were paralyzed. I'll never forget when we were looking for um, an apartment for me to move into. Um, we were in the middle of San Clemente when there's this beautiful view of the ocean. And I had looked at my dad and I had just started coming through the, um, the, depression, the depression part of, of what I'd been dealing with. And I said, Dad, this is God's working through me. I'm going to be able to utilize this experience to um, help the rest of the world and fulfill my purpose. And my dad's eyes welled up with tears. And he looked at me and he goes, you're not going to understand this until you're a father. He's like, but you love your children so much that, Damien, I don't care about the rest of the world. I care about you and your happiness. Wow. And it was just, I mean, we both started crying in that moment. And it was a major breakthrough because I really understood that it wasn't that my parents were, weren't there for me. And then they always were, and I knew that they were. But the extent of which they were was so damaged with, with my, my neck, you know what I mean, that we really needed to band together and... Um, push through it. Because that's, a very, that's a really neat insight, Damien, for you to say that. Help us who are, who are at home and here. What should we do when we come in, in contact with you? Well, I, I don't think there's a uniform way to, to deal with any uh, individual circumstance. And just like uh, you know, being in a wheelchair, everybody's right at the edge of their seat. So um, I, I'd say inquiry. You know, go up and ask. Participate in, in, in the experience of of knowing that um, we ran into each other for a reason. I, I don't expect a, a standard response, more so that I cater my, um, my, my response to other people and their response to me based upon what's given to me. You know what I mean? If somebody comes up and they're, they're a little bit um, scared to speak with me or, or you know, and some little kids just walk around, hey man, what happened? You broke your neck, what's going on? <laughs> yes, so, precisely. <laughs> I just, I've learned to really appreciate the idea that there's really no good or bad about it. I mean, if you're a little bit scared, that's okay, because in a lot of things mm. in life, we all are. And true, if, true. if you're curious, then, you know, pursue it. And if, you know, if you just want to come and do it together with me, then, you know, open a door, or get out of the way. I, I appreciate every interaction with people. And it's probably better to risk the honesty rather than 
not say anything. Are you, you might run into someone who says, well, I'd rather not talk about it. Well, then, then you know that you need to kind of hold off on that. But taking the risk of reaching out and saying, tell me about yourself and getting to know you in a better way, just as we're able to do here on this, the beauty of what a television interview is about, it, it's a blessing. Listen, we're going to come back in just a moment, we need a little bit of a break. I want to know about your dreams. I want to know what's going on in your heart with regard to perhaps a real new direction of a new life, a new hope. Stay tuned. Pardon my Lenten smile. What do you mean smile? Our understanding is that Lent is a somber time of negation and sacrifice. We hear the echoing words of John the Baptist calling out in the desert, repent. We see the 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus in the wilderness and being tested by the devil at the end. In the midst of these gloomy prospects of the 40 days of Lent, Pardon My Lenten Smile, written by Father Mike Manning, offers you some hope. Yes, this offers you a Lenten smile. Don't be gloomy, because the Lord says, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. They neglect their appearance so that they may appear to others to be fasting. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not appear to be fasting except your heavenly Father who is hidden. And your heavenly Father who sees what is hidden will repay you. Do you want this Lent to be different? Pardon My Lenten Smile offers you the way to do this. Each day there is a quote from the day's scripture readings and a short reflection applying it to your everyday life. Filled with practical advice on how to live each day and make this Lent meaningful, it ends with a short and sincere prayer that you can call your own. By Easter, you will have a closer relationship with God. Father Mike Manning's book, Pardon My Lenten Smile, is going to put a smile on every face this Lent as we experience the Lord alive coming out of the tomb. We have got to smile, and that smile is to hang around on every face, every heart, and every soul for a long time. Get this book and bring a smile to your face and to the faces of everyone you love this Lent for your gift of $15 or more. Call the number on the screen. Get it today. Damien, one of the realities in, in my life as a priest that I deal with people is there's an awful lot of people who are overwhelmed with the misfortune and the struggles in their bodies, in their relationships, and in the world in which they live. And they fall into this word depression. You mentioned that uh, before we were talking. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your experience of that word? And then what's the, uh, how did you find a way to somehow move to a a brighter and perhaps more positive understanding of what that reality was. I was kind of hit over the head with it because depression is not a word really that kind of played in my life. I, you know, ra being raised by, you know, a mom and a dad that give you pretty much everything. Um, when I first got hurt, trying to wrap my head around the depression mentality was one of those type of things that was totally foreign to me. So um, working my way through it was it was difficult and it was it was very real. How did you how, how would you describe the depression. What, 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 what were you thinking? What were you feeling? Um, I, I couldn't get angry. And the reason why is, A, I did have faith in God the whole time. And then when I was in a hospital with, you know, 30 other people that had spinal cord injury, it was, I can't really ask, you know, God, why me? Because there's 29 <laughs> other people on the same floor that are dealing with the same thing. So um, it really kicked in when I went home. And I kind of, I, I got to see all the things that I'd grown so familiar to love that I'd looked at my life and said, no, this is who I am. And this is, this is what composes me as Damien, and this is what brings Damien his happiness. Well, now all of a sudden, a curb in front of my house could impede my progress. And it was like, to be able to get past that, there was a little bump um, right outside the door of which I was, uh, that I slept in. And I used to think to myself, if I could just push my chair over that little bump and get out of this room every day, that's, that's a good place to start. And I would obviously do all my prayers before that would happen because my business partner needed to help me get over that bump. And honestly, once I got outside, I mean, it's not like everything stopped or slowed down. It was just a constant pursuit. And I'd, I'd say the biggest thing for me was to be able to understand that um, when there was a polarity of good and bad, then I had the choice to, 
to look at the bad and say, oh, that's so uncomfortable. But when I just started to accept things as they were and to receive them as the gifts that they were, whether they were, uh, you know, something that made me real happy or something that made me otherwise, I started to realize that there was an experience in it all. And when I started to understand that the lesson is going to get me to where I want to go, um, no matter what label I put upon it, it was, it was kind of a, somewhat of a road map to understand that in, you know, in my faith and in my efforts that I knew that it was, uh, it was real and that, and that it was, there, was, there was hope that I could get past that, that feeling that I didn't understand that was so overwhelmed. We're all at the edge of our seats. Yeah. So to, to be able to understand that that's just a part of the process and that the lesson is there if you accept it, um, that was when I started to be able to kind of build a foundation. I mean, I had a foundation with my, with my family and my friends, but in order for me to kind of crawl myself out of the hole, was you really were talking about a healing that you needed in your own being, yes. even before the healing could happen in your in your body. And I had it backwards. I, I had this feeling of well, if, if I just go out and help other people, well, if you don't know how to help yourself, it's very difficult to learn how to help other people. So to get over myself really was 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 the first. Uh, plan of action. So I, I, that's where I really needed to start. And looking in the mirror nowadays, I mean, whether you're in a wheelchair or not, um, it's difficult because we want to just, you know, throw it on our shoulder and just deal with it later. And you, know, you get a case of the, I'll do it tomorrow's, but yeah, yeah. it catches up with you. And especially when you're in a situation where you have to deal with it, um, you know, sooner or later, you just got to be able to look yourself in the mirror and come up with, come up with a way. How do you, how do you talk to people who have been overwhelmed with anger because of the things that have happened in their life? You, you mentioned you seem to be free from that anger. You didn't really have that in a deep way. But could you talk to the people that, are, that have experienced a, a trauma and now are, are deeply in, embedded in an anger towards God? I think it's very similar to the, to the concept of depression, and, it, and it's very real. So for, for the person that is involved in doing that, I mean, I, I consult families now that have gone through very similar uh, circumstances as myself. And to be able to, the, one of the first things you got to do is be able to recognize the fear and, and be able to understand that it, it, it's okay. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be mad. But when you say that people have, you know, are angry with God, I, I think that is, well, at least for me, I found that I was kind of angry with myself in, in my ability to accept God. Say that one, once again. That, that was powerful, what you just said. I was a little bit angry with myself for not being able to know how to accept God because I always knew he was there. And I always had faith that it was there, but how he was in me and working through me, I just didn't understand how to uh, filter it, if you would, wow. or work with it, because it was it, it was That's tough. Beautiful. Or depressed and angry. How are you supposed to come up with positivity and and just go and get through it when you're depressed and angry? Yeah. Maybe not necessarily with God or your family or even yourself. It's it's really difficult to to push through something like that. And this is where God's grace comes in. Yes. And, and it, it's yes, that word that we kind of throw out. But maybe another way is, is saying instead of grace, because it kind of can become pejorative, God's love. He, he comes and he gives you what, what you just said was so profound and so real and so such an ability to kind of build your life on. This ability of knowing God's love is even deeper than we can maybe with our head understand. Amen? Amen. 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 What's your dream of the future? I think dreams are so important. I think to help navigate the ship. Okay, so what got me, um, you know, the, all of the wonderful things that I'd had at, at, at both high school and college was the dream of, of playing football in the NFL. And I wanted to be a professional athlete, and I knew that, you'd, you know, you'd have to work hard to make it happen. And then when, you know, that kind of fizzled, this was before I broke my neck, I kind of had to reevaluate where dreams fit in my life and kind of reevaluate my dreams because when one thing doesn't work out, that doesn't mean that your dream has failed. It just means that the situations that you've been in in your life are, are navigating you in a different direction. So, and that's, yeah. that, this is when, you know, dreams are, are great. And like I said, they're, they're important, but at the same time, um, I, I truly feel that once, you know, experience has pointed me in a different direction, um, my dreams have changed. And, you know, after I got hurt, I had a dream of walking. And I, I figured that, um, I, and one of my major fears was, will I be able to pursue the type of happiness that, that, that I can want to wake up and, and live life every day? So. I figured, oh, okay, if I walk, then you know I'll be able to pursue my happiness, and everybody will think I'm this, you know, incredible person for breaking my neck and, and overcoming it. But that wasn't necessarily God's plan. I mean, I'm sitting here nine years after I got hurt, continuing to still make progress. But at the same time, even in that dream of walking, my my dreams have again changed, and it's been the will of God that's kind of helped me navigate it in a different direction. I've I've always loved helping people, and I've always wanted to help people. And I got to a certain point in my, uh, my therapy progress that um, at around two years, two and a half years, I don't want to say it 
plateau, but it started to slow down a little bit. And I realized that in the meantime of me, um, you know, recovering and regaining my ability to walk and move, I have to find something else to do because the last thing I want to do is push and push for a couple of years and then uh, find myself with nothing to do now that I'm back on my feet. So kind really, of a distorted dream. Yeah, yeah, or backwards dream. You know what I mean? Uh, and I really learned that in this situation, I've um, really given way to the idea that uh, letting my um, wants be dictated by my needs. And what I needed is to have a soulful path in, in the process of me recovering. So what I really found a lot of um, grace in was being able to help other people through my through this process. I how, mean, do you do, how do you help other people? Well, there's a, a multitude of ways. I mean, everybody needs help in a different way. You talked about depression in the very beginning, but you know, it's like a fingerprint. Uh, you, know, you, you help somebody that is in a wheelchair, you, you don't even know you might be helping the family of the person that's in the wheelchair just by being yourself in the moment. No, so no. My, my dream at this point is to just to, um, offer grace to everything that I do and, and understand that when you're at the top of the mountain, there's peaks and valleys and it took you whatever it took to get to that top of the mountain. And, and at one point you're gonna be at the bottom of another mountain and it's, it's your faith that will help push you through. And if you don't have a business partner that you can rely on, you know what I mean? Time and then time again, then you're gonna you're gonna really struggle in those valleys, and you're even gonna struggle at the peak too, because a lot of people get to the top and they realize, well, this is my dream, and here I am living it. Well, I mean that's just part of part of it, because now you have to learn how to accept success, because that could be as much of a curse as failure. And in many ways, Jesus is going to be the one that is, who's your business partner. Huh? Period. <laughs> Period. <laughs> you know, I used to wear a number two when I would play football, and it was a big deal for me, and I kind of I, I kind of. Um, took it as a concept of, of, you know, put your team first, put, you know, put your family first, and that's where you're going to find the grace of God in doing that and being uh, selfless. Okay, so I've always maintained this mentality of being number two, and one of the times when I was dealing with the depressive parts of uh, this whole process, I looked at one of my friends that had been struggling with addiction, and I said, how am I supposed to, you know, be there for other people when I don't have a number one? You know, I, my, my family isn't what I need them to be, the, the girl I was with isn't around anymore, how, how, how I'm number two, man, how can I be... And he looked at me and he said, you got a backwards, brother. He goes, the bottom line is, is you don't ever really need a number one because you should always have a number one. He's like, God is your business partner. God will always be there no matter what happens. And it was like, I always knew that. But it took, you know, with and through my friends and family, somebody to kind of bring that to light. I mean, I'd gone to Catholic school my whole life. I'd studied the Bible. I've, God had been by my side that got me to the top of the mountain in the, in, in the first place. Now here I am in one of the valleys. Now what am I going to do? You know, I've always knew that God was there, but it took one of my other friends to bring me back to the grace that God blesses our lives with and, and let me realize that you've never been alone. You've always had a business partner. And he goes, and don't forget that. The business partner brought you your family. The business partner brought you that girl that you were with. And the business partner brought me my incredible wife that I'm with now. I've been, I was hurt for two years. I've been with a girl for five years, and the last two with me being with a broken neck. And it just turned out that that situation wasn't meant to be. And then when my wife showed up, I found out why. You know what I mean? It was, it was having faith in the grace of God to, to bring me through a very difficult time when I was in a valley, brought me right to the next peak. Amen. Listen, we're going we're gonna to do some praying for some people. Uh, we're going to take a break now, and then we're going to bring in, a, in, in the list of all the people that have been asking for prayers. Great. Okay, we pray for them? Absolutely. Stay tuned. We're going to be praying for you and, and, and helping you if you're in a valley to get up to the next mountain. Stay tuned. Pardon my Lenten smile. Our understanding is that Lent is a somber time of negation and sacrifice. We hear the echoing words of John the Baptist calling out in the desert, repent. We see the 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus in the wilderness and being tested by the devil at the end. In the midst of these gloomy prospects of the 40 days of Lent, Pardon my Lenten smile, written by Father Mike Manning, offers you some hope. Yes, this offers you a Lenten smile. Each day there is a quote from the day's scripture readings and a short reflection applying it to your everyday life. Filled with practical advice on how to live each day and make this Lent meaningful, it ends with a short and sincere prayer that you can call your own. By Easter, you will have a closer relationship with God. Get this book and bring a smile to your face and to the faces of everyone you love this Lent for your gift of $15 or more. Call the number on the screen. Get it today. Damien, you have your, your friend and your, your helper, uh, Dr. Jolly, here with us, uh, a man that I met many years ago. 
But tell us a little story about this, this person that you encountered. We're talking about dreams and how you can help people. There was someone who was, uh, wasn't able to talk. Could you explain that story? Well, um, in a lot of ways, I, I feel like um, another one of the blessings that I've been given with this injury is, is the uh, ability to see things for what they are. And, you know, you always see people explaining that, uh, you know, I need a miracle of this and a miracle of that. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. Every day I come across certain situations, like the one you were talking about with uh, Dr. Jolly. I'm working to help um, with the hyperbarics um, movement. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen is a, is a therapy in which, um, you know, people that have had stroke or... or um, brain injuries and myself spinal cord injuries it's it's very um, beneficial to people that have, have lost uh, some sort of neurological or even movement right so the other day I was at uh, I was at a session and uh, one of the, the patient's wipes was sitting right next to um, the hyperbaric chamber and I had noticed had had I been coming in there a couple of times that um, you know he had he was very injured he couldn't communicate back and forth with his wife and you know he, he kind of had tremors to the point where he looked like he was very very uncomfortable and uh, it was just yesterday that I walked in there and I noticed that uh, his, his gaze was no longer uh, jumbled and that his body wasn't jumping as much anymore. And I looked at her and I was so excited. I was like, gosh, he looks so much better, so much better. And she goes, you know what, the other day, he, uh, when we were driving to a, a therapy session, reached out and grabbed my hand and brought my hand to his lips and kissed my hand. And I almost started crying. I was just like, you know what, if, if that's all that ever happens, okay, in terms of this man's recovery, the grace of God was shown through this man and her effort too for constantly, you know, sticking with him and staying by his side and, and making sure that, you know, I mean, the, the sacred bond of marriage means till death do us part. And yeah, he didn't die, but at the same time, a portion of what she knew to be normal had changed so drastically that most people would turn from that situation. And the fact that she didn't, and she continued to maintain faith and, you know, with all these other um, opportunities medically out there was seeked out hyperbaric oxygen as, as, as a realistic opportunity and had faith in the whole process, God, God spoke mm. to her. And it was amazing. We're, we're, we're looking for miracles here too. Um, Joseph from California is in pain. He has is deep pain. Um, Merle, Mer, 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 Merlier from New York. Daughter's marriage is having a terrible problem. Mary from Illinois, she needs a job. Uh, Vera from Texas, uh, pray for my daughter, for her daughter Sharon. Um, she can't see how to find God. And Martha from California, a granddaughter who, who stayed with her for a year and is, is back in Arizona, and they're, they're insecure with, with taking care. Lord, bless these people. Bless Damien. Bring your healing, bring your peace and love. And may Jesus' love for you always make you smile.